Hi everyone, now that you have a basic understanding of the atom, atomic mass, and isotopes, I would like to talk to you a little bit more about um, a very important aspect of the atom. And those are actually called valence electrons. And the valence electrons will actually get us into um, a bonding model, which you might already have heard of, called the Lewis structure. So let's get started. So, here is a simple model of an atom. This is called actually the Bohr model. Um, your nucleus is in the center, you have your protons and neutrons, and then you have these red dots represent your electrons. Notice that there's different circles here, and a very simplistic way of thinking about these electrons is they kind of orbit the nucleus, kind of like how the planets orbit the sun. It's not exactly right, but it's a, it's a kind of a, a simple, easy way to think about it, which is totally fine. But anyway, so you look at these electrons, and notice how some of these electrons are closer to the nucleus, and some of these electrons in this, um, this ring are further away from the nucleus. So the main point here is that electrons are at different distances from the nucleus. The further away the, nucle the electrons are from the nucleus, the higher energy those electrons have. And the electrons that are in the furthest region from the nucleus are called the valence electrons. So if you look at this example of oxygen, there's two, four, five, six that are in this final ring. And those are the valence electrons here. These two in the middle, they're called your core electrons. They're not part of that valence electron. And the valence electrons are actually really important because they are involved in all your chemical bonding. You can actually predict your valence electrons in a very, 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 very simple way. Okay, so here is um, your periodic table without all the elements listed. But you have your group 1A, your group 2A, your group 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. Notice I'm ignoring the transition elements. So in your main group, these are called your main group, 1 through 8 are your main group. Your group 1A has one valence electron. Your group 2A has two valence electrons. Your group 3 here has three valence electrons. Four, group 4 has four valence electrons. Group 5 has five valence electrons. Six, six valence electrons. Seven, seven valence electrons. And eight, eight valence electrons. Very simple. And it's really nice that you could just actually look at the numbers on the periodic table by their groups and know their valence electrons. Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you um, with this one with actually the uh, elements in the periodic table. So again, you, you're going to ignore the transition elements, not just because they're, you can't predict them as easily as you can the main group. Okay, so um, again, the second step is to either you can use the group number or you can actually count even. You can go one, two, three, four, like that. So for example, oxygen is in 6A and therefore it has six valence electrons. Another example would be magnesium. Magnesium has two valence electrons because it's in the group number 2A. But helium is an exception. It only has two valence electrons. And you might be wondering why. Um, don't worry about too much, but if you actually count across the row, hydrogen has one proton, right? Helium has two protons. What are the maximum number of protons helium must have? Two, to keep it charge neutral. Otherwise, if you had you know, eight valence electrons, you would have, what, eight minus two would give you six negative charge. So no, you can't, you can't have a negative charge on your helium, it needs to be neutral. You have two protons, therefore you must have two electrons maximum. So now that we have the valence electrons out of the way, and you have a general understanding of it, 
um, I want you to kind of get an idea of what models of the atoms are. And we use models to explain um, not just what the material is made of, but also how it is going to behave, how it's going to change, basically how to predict how things are going to react. So an example is hydrogen gas. They actually used this in 1937 for um, a blimp. Uh, it was a cross-Atlantic blimp uh, ride. And as it was landing, it actually blew up. And this is just because hydrogen gas is really um, reactive. Now, if you compare that to helium, which is a noble gas, it's um, more of an inert gas and not very reactive. And this is what we now fill our blimps with. Um, and keep in mind, again, that chemistry is all about the electrons. So if you were to compare the electrons, um, oops, let's go the other way. Here we go. So for example, if you compare the electrons of hydrogen, you would have the same valent, number of valence electrons as hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, whatever. All these guys here in group one have one valence electron. All of these elements are highly reactive. They are very similar in terms of their reactivity as hydrogen. And the same thing if you look at helium, all of these guys here, helium, neon, argon, all these guys here, they're noble gases, they're all inert, and they have very similar properties. And they also have the same number of valence electrons. So again, keep in mind, chemistry is all about electrons. We can actually use a very simplistic modeling, um, which is called Lewis, one type is called Lewis bonding theory. And we can use this to describe how atoms bond together. And atoms bond because it results in a more stable electron configuration or a more stable electron arrangement. The atoms bond together by either transferring or sharing electrons so that all atoms obtain an outer shell with eight electrons. That's the important part here, eight electrons. And that means they will look like a noble gas because you're most of, except for helium, all your other noble gases have eight valence electrons. And this is called your octet rule because of the eight electrons. Note, there are some exceptions to this rule. Okay, and the key to remembering is to try to get an electron configuration like a noble gas, the closest noble gas. So for example, say helium is your closest noble gas. Your exceptions to that would be lithium, beryllium, and hydrogen, and of course helium. All these will only have two electrons to double it because they're more likely, they're going to look, try to look like helium since helium is the closest noble gas to them. We can represent, using the Lewis structures, we can represent our valence electrons with dots. So for example, lithium is in column one or group one, so it has one valence electron, put one dot. Beryllium would have two, and you can keep going forward. And notice that we, for example, carbon, each dot, each valence electron goes around the, um, the symbol for carbon. And then once you've gone around all the way, then you can put another dot. So nitrogen would be another dot here, where it's paired. And then finally you get to neon, where you have your octet. So again, it's stable, because that's your noble gas. It has eight valence electrons. Again, helium only has two but it is still stable. So here's your first example. So we're gonna write a Lewis structure for water. Your first step, okay, you're gonna write out how many electrons you have. Okay, valence electrons, right? So each hydrogen has one valence electron. You have two hydrogens, so that's two plus six right so two times each one is one plus six for your oxygen gives you eight valence electrons your second step is just to write out a basic structure okay, you're going to put oxygen in the middle and then the two hydrogens on the side okay your your skeleton structure should be symmetrical step three put bonds between them So each of these bonds 
you end up using two electrons for each bond. So this would be two. Four electrons are used, which means you have four remaining electrons. Hydrogen can only have two electrons total due to the doublet rule, so you can put the remaining electrons around your oxygen. So that would give you two, four, six, eight. So your octet rule is satisfied on oxygen, and your hydrogens have doublets. Okay, so that's just a simple example. And to note, you can actually have double bonds. In the water example, you only have a single bond, but you may need to use a double bond if, for example, you cannot satisfy the octet rule. So say you have oxygen, the O2, O2 oxygen in the air. Each oxygen only has six valence electrons. So if you were just to bond it with a single bond, which is like, again, the two dots, or you could put a single line, either one is fine, you would have 12 electrons. And this guy on the left, two, four, six, only has six valence electrons surrounding it. So the octet rule is not satisfied. To make up for that, you can actually take one of the pairs on the other oxygen and put it in the middle, right, so you have two dots, or you put the lines, they mean the same thing. What happens then is you now have two, four, six, eight, around one oxygen and two, four, six, eight around the other oxygen. So now both oxygens um, have been satisfied with the octet rule. You can actually do the same thing with a triple bond for the same reason. So for example, you have nitrogen in the air and two. Each N atom has five valence electrons. So in the end, you're only going to have 10 valence electrons here. It's not enough to give an octet rule to satisfy an octet rule for either nitrogen. So what you can do is you can actually take two of these um, these pairs of electrons and put them in the middle. So now they're being shared by both nitrogens. So you're going to have two, four, six bonds actually being shared, or six electrons being shared, or you can draw those with lines. And so that's called a triple bond. So you have one, two, three, triple, triple bond. But now if you count, you have two, four, six, eight valence electrons around each nitrogen. And again, your octet rule is now satisfied. Okay, for example, you can write a Lewis structure for CO2 or carbon dioxide. Step one, count your valence electrons. I have 16 electrons. I got that from four from the carbon, plus I have two oxygens, two times the six valence electrons for oxygen equals 16. Draw my structure out. It should be symmetrical. Okay, I can draw just the bond between them. I have four electrons used. I have 12 electrons remaining. So I'm just going to go ahead and put, start putting dots around the oxygens to give them the octet rule. The octet rule is satisfied for the oxygens, and I'm out of electrons. So notice I've used them all up. I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So I've used up all the electrons, the valence electrons. But the carbon, the octet rule is not satisfied. So what I can do is actually convert the, um, the, the lone pairs out on the sides of the oxygen into a double bond. And now everyone has the octet rule satisfied. Carbon, so for the oxygens, they have two, four, six, eight. And the carbon has two, four, six, eight. The final thing you should be aware of is resonance. So Lewis structures often do not accurately represent the electron distribution in a molecule. And real molecules are a hybrid of all possible Lewis structures. And resonance stabilizes the molecule. So what that means for you is that if you look at these double bonds here, and I have single bonds, you notice how these are all oxygen, so it's the same uh, um, atom. What actually occurs is that this double bond that the, this bond is actually, um, if you draw resonance, okay, just to show you, you put these arrows here between all the molecules, 
and the double bond could be on any of the oxygens, right? Why, why pick one? It could be any of them, really, right? And so what this really means is that the structure, the size of the bond is somewhere in between a double bond and a single bond, but the way we represent that is through these, showing all the possible structures. We call this resonance. Okay, everyone, that's it for now. I'll see you next time.